everybody and welcome back to another great episode of Mind Matters, Navigating Head Injuries and Concussions. I'm your host, Kylie Como. I'm the legal nurse consultant here at Shane Smith Law. And today I'm pleased to be speaking with Dr. Jeremy Herza once again. Dr. Herza is a board certified neuropsychologist and serves as the executive director of Neurobehavioral Associates in Augusta, Georgia. With over 10 years of experience, he specializes in traumatic brain injury, concussion care, rehabilitation, and neuropsychological assessments for both children and adults. Additionally, he's the clinical associate professor of neurology and psychiatry at the Medical College of Georgia and has previously been president of the Brain Injury Association of South Carolina. His work encompasses clinical practice, education, and advocacy for individuals affected by brain injury. If you missed the first part of our discussion on understanding and evaluating brain injuries, please do yourself a favor and go back and watch that. With that, let's jump back in for the second part of our conversation revolving around the legal and collaborative perspectives on brain injury cases. Dr. Herza, from a from a forensic standpoint, we'll say, what role does neuropsychological assessments play in documenting brain injury for litigation and disability claims? Well, the way I look at it is there's a number of key questions that lawyers have regarding these type of injuries, right? Mm -hmm. So one is, was there an injury? Mm -hmm. Two, how severe is the injury? Three, how does that injury impact function? Four, what are the, what's the current and future care needs? So neuropsychology is the only type of assessment you can do that will answer all four questions with one assessment. So we're able to say, yes, there's change. This is what I think it's due to. This is the severity. This is what we need to do for treatment. And this is the life care plan or treatment that's needed in order to support someone. So it, it takes a while to get through the assessment, but when you're done, you're left with concrete, objective, valid data uh, to really guide all these different things. That's excellent. I know we, we really um, look for and try to curate that, that list of experts, especially that life care plan. Those can be so, so beneficial um, when, you're, when you're going to demand or even to court. Uh, in, in a lot of these cases. So uh, great to know. What challenges do you often encounter in providing expert testimony? I know you've done quite a bit of that uh, from, from hearing what you're, what we were saying earlier or in de depositions really related to concussion and TBI cases. Well, I think it's important to be honest and I mm -hmm. think it's important to own all the different factors that are going on and make sense of them. So for me, that means considering facts that may or may not line up with concussion as a cause. So, you know, if that means considering your vascular risk factors, like your high blood pressure and your diabetes, or your meds, or the fact you had ADHD before, or that you're not sleeping at all, and then you're in a ton of pain, like, I have to make sense of all that. So, you know, sometimes I'm pushed in, in to say, well, how much of the injury is due to brain injury versus their severe pain? And sometimes the answer is, that's not how it works. It's both things together, which is why they're impacted. Now, both of those are due to the accident, mm -hmm. but, you know, life isn't really clean. And all of us come into, you know, different concussions and accidents with our entire life's history, right? Yeah. I mean, to give you an, uh, uh, a kind of an arbitrary example, I do also, um, I do ages two on up. I do autism work. I do okay. dementias. I do... Parkinson's diseases, metabolic diseases, all these kind of things. So when you look at Alzheimer's as an example, there's actually not that many people that have just Alzheimer's without anything else because their average age of onset of Alzheimer's is 70. So they have all their other medical crap on top of it. So often it's a, it's a variety of factors together that's causing that functional impairment. So I'm able to tease that apart, but sometimes people really want that one answer even mm -hmm. though if they actually think about it for a second, they understand that life doesn't work that way. So, Dr. Herza, um, how do you or in your team work with other medical and, and legal professionals when you're managing these really complicated TBI cases? My job, and I have a variety of them, is to run treatment plans, to understand what's going on and to coordinate care. I currently manage mental health at the largest wound care burn center in the country. Um, I'm part of the rehab team. I manage brain injury on the rehab floor. Um, my career has spent at least in part in rehab. And so, you know, what that means for me is I'm always looking at how to pull the team together to mm -hmm. maximize recovery. Now, 
Medicine over the last decade has evolved from going from silos to integrated back to silos. Yes. Where the doctors aren't always talking right. And, you know, if you're not all part of one organization, no one has any clue what's going on. And so I always feel like it's my responsibility to pull all the different disciplines together so everyone's working towards a common goal. So when you refer a patient to us, if you refer a patient to Neuropsych Centers of Georgia, you know that we are going to look at psychiatry and psychotherapy and neuro rehab, speech therapy, what medications do you need, what's going on physically, and that is going to be fully integrated to maximize your recovery. And unfortunately, I don't feel like that's done all that often. So we really eliminate the fragmented care. So it's a comprehensive, integrated model. You won't get any arguments from me on the going from the silo to a little better integrated back to, to siloing again. Uh, I spent a little time in healthcare leadership before this role, and, and that's, that is the trajectory it took. So that kind of one-stop shop approach, if you will, is, is always appreciated. There's nothing more frustrated to to our team or more so to clients to, to then to have this provider saying this and directing this and another in, and then, you know, them trying to make sense of it all, the, 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 the injured patient or client. Uh, that is super frustrating. So thank you for that. Um, One of the things that um, yeah. I hear from uh, my patients, clients often is they don't actually understand why they're seeing all these people. Yes. They don't really know what all these treatments are for. They have no clue what all these appointments are for. You could say, well, why are you going to this doctor? I don't even know. You yeah. Know? So like no one's really explaining to them. No one's really like owning it. No one's really like truly championing how all these things fit together. So we really take pride. And uh, I was speaking with a patient earlier today. And um, as we discussed her injuries, she, you know, she was visibly upset because of how it's affected her life. And I told her, mm -hmm. I said, look, one of the things you need to understand about me is when the lawyers are gone, when the case is over, I'm not going to turn my back on you. Mm. I, I'm not going to leave you high and dry. If, if I'll personally help you, I will. If I need to set you up with somebody, I, I will. I'll do whatever I can. But just know if we are working with you, we're going to help you land in the best plop, you know, possible place you can. Yeah. And that you have the best life you can. Because that's ultimately why we're here, right? It so is. That people end up with the, the best quality of life they can. So... Yeah. This isn't something where we're just here when the lawyers are around. When the lawyers right. are gone, we're still here and we're still helping our patients. Yeah, that that is so appreciated. I think, you know, for working for the firm that I do, having having um, you know, medical personnel inside of the firm, I think gives that a unique angle, kind of that same thing you're talking about. It's not about, you know, just we're going to check in, you know, for this case. And as we really want to see our clients get better, we want to get them back to where they were and trying to coordinate some of that. It, it can be difficult, but um, it is it is so needed. Um, yeah, you run into things like non-compliance when you're dealing with, you know, clients or patients that have brain injuries and they get super frustrated. So they just stop going to appointments. Um, you know, they, they run into things like polypharmacy and all that. I'm sure you see quite a bit of, of that um, as you try to manage some of these more complicated cases. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, what advancement in brain injury research or treatments are you most excited about that might impact personal injury litigation? Well, I think there's a number of new assessments, uh, things that have come out. Uh, in the last couple of years, there's been some talk about, you know, different biomarkers and blood tests that can help determine if the axons are broken and if there are pieces of axons still kind of floating around, uh, there's vestibular ocular testing that's fascinating. And, you know, the, the idea there is that the eyes in particular, you know, obviously go right into the brain. And so how the eyes respond to stimuli can tell you if there's disruption in that circuitry. Um, so, you know, for me, some of these new advances that help us understand the brain disruption is, is fascinating. Um, from a recovery perspective, there's lots of things, everything from hyperbaric oxygen to different types of infusions um, that have shown some efficacy. General rule of thumb for me is there is no you know, one all end all kind of thing. Whether you're looking at brain injury, you're collecting data that supports it together. And when you're doing treatment, you have to come at it from multiple angles. Um, and just like in general medicine, there is no singular cure for something. You know, everybody's different. And so it, it's really understanding and matching the type of treatment, whether it's, you know, something new or whether it's something that's very well established to that patient that patient needs. So 
it, it requires, I think, a, a pretty well-versed provider to be able to do that and guide people appropriately. Unfortunately, in the legal realm, sometimes you see different modalities and different things that are mm. just not as well accepted uh, by the medical community. And I think it's important to really kind of weigh those and understand what truly is the best course for somebody. Yeah, agree, agree. What what advice might you give um, to say other healthcare providers that may be listening, or you know, legal nurse consultants or attorneys? And, you know, when we're talking about effectively working with healthcare providers to help advocate for our, our clients or patients with brain injuries, I think it's important that uh, you try not to have a piecemeal approach. Mm -hmm. And if you have a piecemeal approach, you have somebody coordinating care, there has to be communication across providers. Um, obviously, I advocate for a neuropsych assessment because otherwise you just don't know how bad things are or what's real. Um, also, a neuropsychological assessment can test for malingering and validity. And so we have to be confident and stand by, you know, what's real. And the reality of is in these situations is that, you know, you could sit there with somebody and think they're giving their all and sometimes they're not mm -hmm. and we need data to, that we could stand by that and so that that's something that we can do and also that it's never too late and this goes back to kind of the positive message we ended on last time mm -hmm. um and going back to kind of this analogy that says we could still form detours in the brain so it's never too late there's always something that we can do even if it's helping you develop new ways of compensating or putting new parameters in your life for you, you to be successful, it's never too late for you to get help and for your life to improve. So I encourage lawyers and patients and the people that have been through things to, to really look for help and for some guidance because that's our job. That's yes. our mission. And that's what we devoted our life to. Well said. Well said. Dr. Hertz. Was there anything else uh, that you can think you'd like to drill down on, go back to any other subject matter you'd want to talk about? I always like to try to, to give that back to The only thing I think I would highlight um, mm -hmm. that I personally find fascinating is that while the brain undergoes the chemical changes after a concussion, it also has the nervous system response to stress. And so the chemicals of the brain during that time and the whole body is responding. And that comes from the brain. And PTSD is brain damage, right? All mental health disorders are in fact, neurologic disorders. So depression is very clear underpinnings. PTSD, we know what circuits, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, how that connects to the amygdala and the frontal lobe, but we know exactly what happens. ADHD, mm. the frontal lobe doesn't work as well. There's not as many connections. So if you have someone that has brain trauma and they've been through lots of stress, they're getting it from both angles. They have the mental health issues that are brain related, neurologically related, and they have whatever happened due to concussion, mild, moderate, severe TBI. So it's important that you consider both of those together understanding how drastically they compound things. One of the things that, that we do for non-TBI patients is mm -hmm. a pain assessment, a neuropsychology pain assessment. And what we're trying to understand and what we can capture incredibly accurately is how non-TBI patients, how their pain, how their mood, how their medications impact their thinking for their life, impact their emotions for their life and what type of treatment they're gonna need for those because of their physical injuries. So a professor told me once, he said, Jeremy, all psychology, all psychiatry is neuropsychology. That's the truth. If it comes from the brain, it's all integrated. So it's not just about concussions. It's about anybody who's had trauma and understanding the brain, how it affects their lives and supporting them the right way. All right, everybody, that wraps up another episode of Mind Matters, Navigating Head Injuries and Concussions. We sincerely thank Dr. Jeremy Herza for joining us today and generously sharing his deep expertise and insights. Be sure to connect with Dr. Herza and the Neurobehavioral Associates team in Augusta, Georgia, or at Neuropsych Centers of Georgia. I hope our listeners have found this conversation as enlightening as and engaging as I have. Please don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel to keep up with our latest and greatest content, and leave us a comment to let us know what you thought of our discussion today. And as always, remember, if you're in pain, 
Call Shane at 980-999-9999. Thanks for joining us. In pain, so I call Shane. 980-999-9999. In pain, call Shane.